Hare Krishna. So today morning, Srimad Bhagavatam, we are discussing about the position of King Pluto. And I talk today about how the transcendental manifests through the material. Basically, we'll talk about the bonds and the boundaries between the finite and the infinite. We are all finite souls, God is infinite. So what are the bonds between them? What are the boundaries between them? So he, here is a very interesting word used to describe Prutu. It's Vainya. Vainya, Vena was his father. And he was a demonic person. And his, Prutu is referred to as his son Vainya. Now normally, it's a common tradition, a common convention in the dharmic traditions to refer to people by their father's name. Can you give some examples of this? Pandava is Pandav, yes. Ram is called Dashrathaya. Like that, we have so many places where even Krishna is called as Vasudeva or Nanda Nandana. Nanda Nandana is still there as a different Vas Vasudeva. The names vary slightly. Now, in some cases, this is wonderful because the parents are also wonderful. Now, in this case, his parent is a, his father is a demon. Now, to be associated with somebody demoniac is not something very pleasant, and to be associated by birth. So here we see this extraordinary thing, and this is being spoken as a matter of praise. Normally, if you if you tell someone, oh, you're the son of an underworld dawn. Uh, maybe if we are among criminals, that might be a praise. But for ordinary citizens, we would say, uh, law-abiding citizens, why are you mentioning that? Are you trying to be spiteful toward me? Trying to mock me? So, normally, see, we all are defined not just by who we are, but by whose we are. We are defined not just by our identity, but also by our connections. And that's how people perceive us. You know, people may look at us, say, somebody looks at me and they say, okay, you are an Indian. Somebody looks at somebody else and say, brown skin means Indian. Say, black skin means maybe African. Or a particular accent means from Japan or from China or from the Arabic countries, wherever. So reality is so complex that for us to process reality, we need to categorize it. And at a basic level, when we meet someone, okay, if it's a small baby, a small child, we'll talk with them in a different way. With a, maybe a PhD professor will talk in a different way. So we, and we need to categorize to function. And one way we categorize is because we can't, unless we get to know the person at a personal level, at an introductory level, we have to categorize, okay, where is this person coming from? When we are trying to share Krishna Bhakti, the first thing we need to know is, is this person already knowing some devotional uh, devotional terminology or there's no devotional terminology there. And accordingly, we have to speak. So we constantly classify in this way. So this particular classification of Prutu as Vainya, as the son of Vainya, this is biologic. Now, it's being signified over here. See, normally it is said the, the, the children carry on the legacy of their parents. Uh, here, Prutu is being glorified for something else. That the Dharma Avaluptam, that the principles of Dharma had been destroyed by Vena. But you have restored them. You have appeared and you have restored them. So, sometimes the legacy of the parents has to be carried on and sometimes... It has to be stopped. And here the glorification is, sometimes we glorify someone in a way that, oh, you came from illustrious background and you are also illustrious person. But another way to glorify would be, somebody came from a very poor or deprived background and still they have become very glorious. People talk about, I'm a self-made man or I'm a self-made woman. That means, I didn't have anyone helping me. I didn't have any godfather. I didn't have any contacts. But, uh, so that, that is also another way of glorifying that this so sometimes we are glorified for having come from illustrious antecedents and sometimes we are glorified 
for having come up from the opposite kind of antecedents and still having risen over our circumstances, risen above our circumstances. So Vainya is not used to label and deride him. You are the son of Vena. Although you are the son of Vena, just see how different you are. Which other example is there in the Bhagavatam of the son and the father being utterly different in character? Prahlala and Hiranyakashipu. And there are examples of son and father being similar in character also. We have Dhritarashtra and Duryodhan. Right? Duryodhan is not just similar, Duryodhan is one step worse. If we consider a movie with villains, Dhritarashtra is like the passive villain. And Duryodhan is the active villain. So, now here, if we consider the topic I said is because of what initially, how the transcendental manifests through the biological. That <clears throat> each say we all acquire certain characteristics from our parents sometimes it is it is said as a saying that the uh, the apple never falls far away from the tree what that means is that if, if somebody is born from a particular parent they will be like that but is that always true how much is it true and how much is it not true what all at, at a basic, basic biological level, we get our genes from our parents. Okay. And that's how we inherit certain characteristics. Now the, the Varanashram system, which is now degenerated into the caste system, that had this understanding that birth is not just an accident. That means from which family we are born, that is not just accident. What it means is that, say, if... Uh, a Brahmana couple unite. They are already living a life of spiritual principles. And when they unite, there is a, you could say, a subtle gravity pull that attracts souls of similar disposition. And that's how when a Brahmana couple unite, the soul that is born through them is likely to have Brahmanical qualities. This is not always true, but traditionally, it was when the when the Varanashram was there, it was expected the son of the, the children of Kshatriyas would be Kshatriyas. The children of Vaishyas would be Vaishyas. Why? Because if everybody was living in a dharmic way, then they would have the kind of disposition expected of their sociocultural focus, sociocultural classification or designation. And accordingly they would attract souls of that way. So in a sense, it is not just that the, we get the genes from our parents. It's also that it's quite likely that because we have a disposition similar to our parents, that's from our previous life. That's why we are born in that family. However, this is not universal. There are multiple factors which determine the birth of who, who is born where. So he described that Hiranyakashipu, for example, had gone to meditate on Vishnu, gone to meditate on how to kill Vishnu, to get powers by how to kill Vishnu. But at that time, he heard some birds. When he was meditating, he heard the bird chanting, Vishnu, Vishnu, Vishnu. And these birds were actually sages who were there as a part of a plan. And then he said, what is this Vishnu? I don't want to remember him. I want to remember how to destroy him. So he said, my austerity is not working. Just like suppose we are trying to chant and there's too much disturbance. He just put a chant later. So that he said, okay, I stopped my austerity. He came back to his home. And that's the time when he united with his wife. And the thought of Vishnu, Vishnu, Vishnu. Those sounds which the sages had spoken, they were going in his mind. So, although his habitual consciousness was demoniac, at that time, the thoughts of the Lord were going on in his mind. Incidentally. And that's how he got a son as saintly as so, it's not entirely predictable. It's, re it's a reasonable inference that the, that the soul born of particular parents will have particular qualities. But it's not always essential because many factors come into the picture. Now, in this case, of course, with respect to Pluto, he was not born by ordinary means. Veda was killed by the just the utterance of disapproval by the sages. And after he was killed, his body was churned. And from the churning, Pruthu came up. 
So in a sense, Vena had nothing to do with the birth of Putra. It's just that his body happened to be the source, happened to be not even the source, the channel through which Prutu came about. And he ate. So, so, uh, so oh, it was what to speak of whether Vena had ap appropriate consciousness when Prutu was conceived. Vena had no consciousness. He was already dead. But then why did, why, why did the Lord, why did Prutu have to choose to come to this particular body? Actually, the point here is that sometimes the Lord demonstrates how just as a lotus can blossom in the dirtiest of places. Similarly, the divine can manifest in the unlikeliest of places. Now, certain animals are considered conventional. In different cultures, it might be different, but certain animals are considered clean, certain animals are considered unclean. So a hog or a boar is not considered particularly clean. But what happens? The Lord manifests as Varahadi. And when he manifests in this way, he actually demonstrates that he is not affected at all by his sect. By where, in which body he has appeared or even from which body he has appeared. So the Bhagavatam in many ways demonstrates the transcendence of the Lord. And of course, the transcendence of those who are devoted to the Lord also. So the transcendental can manifest through the biological through any bio, any level. Sometimes, like Lord Chaitanya was born to parents who were already Brahminical and very devoted. Krishna was born to parents who were Kshatriyas. But here we see Vena appeared through, uh, he was not so much a Kshatriya, as a Kshatra Bandhu, as a person who was a, who was a disgrace to the name of Kshatriyas. Kshatriya is one who kshatrayate iti kshatriya, one who protects others from harm. But here, he was the one causing harm to others. So he's a disgrace to Kshatriyas, but the Lord appeared through that. And that is his transcendence. So the Lord can manifest anywhere, in any place, even in the unlikeliest of places. Actually, Prabhupada, when he was sharing Krishna consciousness, often he would he would take whatever place was available and suitable for a temple. And sometimes those places might have been places where all kinds of uh, unholy activities might have happened there. Of course, when there was facility, Prabhupada built magnificent temples. But he understood that the Lord can manifest anywhere. And if we have the facility, we build a temple at a, at, a, at a place which is already auspicious. But if that is not possible, then even if we get a... The important thing is to get the Lord to manifest, to glorify the Lord. So even if the place is auspicious, it doesn't matter. So the transcendental can manifest anywhere through the material. The transcendental does not depend on any particular material condition for manifestation. And that is highlighted through the point of Vainya. So with respect to us, how much of our, what we are is determined by our lineage, our parents. We all acquire certain things from our parents, but we always have free will. And some things which we learn from our parents, we take it and build on it. And some things we learn and we realize this is not, this is not in my best interest. Then we keep a distance from it. So we are, we are products of our past. But we are not prisoners of our past. We are products, we can't deny that. We are products of our past. So the family and the dynasty where we have come from, it matters. But it, that doesn't imprison us. We can, we can be our own persons and we can grow to be who we are meant to be. All the more so if we connect with Krishna. So we, so, so we are not at all, the, the Supreme Lord is of course not limited by where he comes from. And we too are not limited if we connect with the Supreme, especially. Then whatever past influences are there, they can be con countered by the omnipotence of the Lord. So that was the first point. Now interestingly about the avatar, which is talked about over here, Prabhupada says that he is a Shaktya avatar. So the word avatar is 
a very interesting word avatariti iti avatar that one who descends is called an avatar in the sanskrit meaning so basically there are two levels of reality there is material reality and there is spiritual reality and people often say nowadays there is the idea of philosophical relativism they say oh you have your philosophy i have my philosophy everybody has their own philosophy and the bhagavad gita also offers one such world view actually what the bhagavad gita offers is not just another world view it offers another world to view <laughs> what does it mean another world view means okay another way of looking at this world that could be there but the most important thing about who it offers is not just another way to view this world but another world to view it reveals that there is a spiritual reality and it gives us the process by which we can raise our consciousness upward till we perceive that spiritual reality it happens gradually through purification so if we understand this point that there is the spiritual and the material then the when the spiritual when the lord who exists as a supreme spiritual reality descends to the material level that is avatar avatar is that the lord descends is not that he's, he he takes birth is already existing in his self same glory and he descends to this world now some religious traditions say that avatars are not possible itself because if they say that this world is finite and god is infinite and the infinite cannot can never manifest in the finite because the finite would be destroyed the finite cannot hold it so uh, their idea is that say now imagine if a blue whale were to come into this hall if the blue whale is bigger than this hall it just can't come in if it came in the whole hall would break apart so they have that kind of idea that the infinite cannot manifest in the finite and they say that it, the idea that an infinite can manifest in the finite itself is sacrilege it is something which is a which is a minimization of the infinite however this idea while seeming to venerate the infinite it actually denigrates the infinite but because if the infinite is truly infinite then the infinite can do anything and that means the infinite can manifest even in the finite if god is omnipotent if god can do anything then you say he can't manifest in the finite that means there's something which he can't do so god is unlimited but he is not stuck with his unlimitedness like some people are super tall now sometimes being tall is an advantage you can see when everything is blocked but sometimes if it's a low door through which you have to enter or the ceiling is low then you have to stoop down continuously somebody is very tall they are stuck with their height they they are tall and they can't become short <laughs> so god is not stuck with his unlimitedness he is unlimited but his unlimitedness is such that he is he can manifest in a limited seeming form and still stay unlimited it doesn't he's not stuck with his unlimitedness so that's how the infinite can manifest in the arena of the finite why because that is the infinite's infinite potency god's unlimitedness is that not that he stuck with his unlimitedness but he can his unlimitedness such that he can manifest in a limited seeming form and still retain his unlimited potency and that applies that when the lord descends to the material world now prabhupad is very emphatic in saying that and the lord descends he doesn't come in a material form his form is still transcendent and prabhupada would quote 911 in the bhagavad gita avajananti ma mudha manushyan tanma ashritam param bhav ma jananto abhut maheshwaram so he says that those there are three three ways here the word is there janana so people in general so people in general they they state can be jananti ajananti and avajananti jananti means to know correctly ajananti means to not know at all avajananti means to know the opposite of the actual so in a sense there's a difference between ignorance and illusion 
although we may group the two words together. Ignorance means to not know. Illusion means to know falsely. Mm -hmm. So if I if it's dark, it's ignorant. But I, I mean, it, I can't see anything. That's ignorance. That's like ignorance. But if I see a mirage, that's not ignorance. It's, it's more than ignorance. In, in some ways, it's worse than ignorance because we don't know and we think we know. So, uh, so what happens is there may be some people who are ignorant about God, but there are some people who are illu illusioned about God. And when Krishna descends to this world, they mistake him to be an ordinary human being. And that is very dangerous, Krishna says. So although he manifests in a limited form, he is not limited. So 9-11 says they are a mudha, they are foolish people. Because he retains, Mama Bhuta Maheshwaran, he retains his infinite potency even while manifesting in a finite form. Now having said this, so the, we talk about the boundary between the finite and the infinite is that, that the, that, that boundary is not such that the finite cannot come, the infinite cannot come to the finite. The infinite can definitely come to the realm of the finite. And what makes the infinite come? That is the infinite's love for the finite. So there, are, so there is the infinite's love for the finite. And how much is that love? That's infinite. The infinite's love for the finite is also infinite. So there is there is there is some religious tradition they say there cannot be any such thing as avatar as a descent. There are some other religious traditions say that there is only one incarnation. And they say that it's a singular one-time event in the history of the universe. And all of deliverance is, uh, is the deliverance of all of humanity centered around accepting that one-time descent of the divine. So now this idea is in some ways you might say it's better than the complete otherness of God. That God is completely inaccessible to us as some traditions say. But still to reduce God's descent to only one event or one occurrence, what it means is that we are basically limiting God's love. That even if somebody doesn't come to know about that avatar, or that particular incarnation, or that particular manifestation of the divine, then what is the hope for their deliverance? So, because the infinite's love for the finite is infinite, therefore, Indrari Vyakulam Lokam Rudayanti Yuge Yuge. The Bhagavatam says that the Lord appears again and again and again. Sambhavami Yuge Yuge. In every millennia. And how many manifestations of the Lord are there? It is said that how many, how many descents, how many avatars? As many as there are waves in an ocean. That means it's countless. Countless. As many waves in the ocean, that many avatars are there. Because the love of the infinite with the finite is infinite. So now, now having said this, so we are looking at the topic is how does the in, infinite manifest in the finite? So the first idea that infinite can never manifest in the finite is the conception of the Islamic tradition. The idea that the finite, infinite, the descent to the finite is a one-time event. That is the Christian idea. That Jesus, the divinity of Christ manifested in the humanity of Jesus. That's what the Nicene Creed says. Now, beyond that, in Hinduism, there has been another idea. This idea that the infinite can manifest in the infinite love is infinite and the idea that there can be as many as many there are as many incarnations as there are waves in the ocean that has led to the idea that everyone is God I was at a college program and I saw a poster there was a yoga student here wearing this uh, t-shirt that is slogan I was an atheist till I discovered I was God <laughs> God doesn't need to discover that they are God. God is infinite. If God had come, God needed to discover something, needed to discover, that means God didn't know it. There's some force which made God ignorant. And there are some teachers who come to say, one particular teacher he says, there are many teachers in the past who have come and said, I am God. He said, I have not come 
So this is a self-centered message. I have come to give a selfless message. My message is not I am God. My message is you are God. And it appears such a titillating thing for people. For the ego, it is such an ego trip to think I am God. But it's it's we are so controlled. Prabhupada talked about one spiritual teacher who 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 used the who, talk, who had this idea that who was teaching this idea that we are all God. And he said that he went to he was going to give a talk on the secret of immortality. And as he was going for that talk, he met with a car accident and died. <laughs> so he was going to talk about immortality, but he went with his own mortality. So we are we are finite. We we are not God. So there is in our tradition at one level a very clear. I talk about the how there is the conceivably the finite, the infinite can manifest in the finite. But still there is a boundary between the finite and the infinite. The, there is the Anu Atma and the Vibhu Atma. The Anu Atma, Anu is small, finite. There is a finite soul and Vibhu Atma is the infinite soul. And Chaitanya Charitamra describes the difference between the two as that the Supreme Lord is Maya Dhish and we are Maya Dhin. Maya Dhish means he is the Lord of Maya. He is the controller of Maya, controller of the illusory energy, and we are controlled by the illusory energy. So, <clears throat> if we consider this differentiation, that there is a finite soul and there is an infinite soul. And the finite soul never becomes infinite. Mamai Vamsho Jeeva Loke Jeeva Bhutaha Sanadana Krishna says that <clears throat> we are all parts of Krishna. And that's how we will be eternal. But we can be parts who are harmonized with him or we are parts who are disconnected from him. If we are disconnected, we stay dissatisfied. If we become connected, we become contented. So we become satisfied, we become fulfilled. So the whole process of bhakti is of spiritual connection. So the finite can go to the world of the infinite. But that doesn't mean the finite becomes infinite. So, so the divine descent is meant to inspire the human ascent. The, from the spiritual level of reality, the divine descends to the material level. So that those of us who are at the material level can rise, can feel inspired to rise to the spiritual level. And how do we feel inspired? It is by gaining the knowledge. Knowledge of the totality of reality and knowledge about the beauty of the spiritual reality. And that's what is told to us through Krishna Tattva and Krishna Lila. By which each one of us So those of us who are who become devoted to the Lord we rise and attain Him eventually. At the same time the boundary between the finite and the infinite remains. So this boundary seems to become a little fuzzy with the category of Shakti Avesh Avatar. So what is this Shakti Avesh Avatar? Shakti means strength or power. Shakti is sometimes used specifically to refer to the goddess. She is called a Shakti. And then the god is called a Shaktiman, the possessor of power. So, so now Shakti Shaktya Avesh. Shaktya Avesh. Avesh is manifestation, appearance. So Shaktya Avesh Avatar is, Avatar means the divine descends to the material, uh, the, from the spiritual to the material. So Shaktya Avesh means it's not literally the, that God descends, but God's power descends. God's power descends and it manifests in a particular person. And such people, they are considered Shaktyavish avatars. So when somebody is extraordinarily empowered by the divine, that those personalities are called a Shaktyavish avatar. Now Jiva Goswami, uh, our Acharya has written many books about this. So Brihat Bhagavata Amrit is a book which describes about the spiritual world. 
and Lagu Bhagavatamrita, another book, Lagu Bhagavatamrita discussed elaborately the uh, various kinds of avatars, what are the different ways in which this crossing over from the spiritual to the material level happens. And there this category of Shakti Avish avatar is also described. Now in our tradition, there are, there are two schools of opinion. Is the list of Shakti Avish avatar, is it exhaustive, which Yuga Swami gives, or is it indicative? Exhaustive means that list is given, that these, these, these personalities are Shakti Avish avatar. Is that all that is Shakti Avish avatar? Or can there be more Shakti Avish avatars also? So for example, Prabhupada says over here in this purport that Prutu is considered to be a Shakti Avish avatar. So he is, he got this special potency by the grace of the Lord by which he could establish dharma. He could establish the rule of virtue in the world. So now, one of Shri Prabhupada's god brothers, he said that Shri Prabhupada was also Shakti Avishavata. Now what he did was unparalleled, extraordinary. Like the way he shared Krishna consciousness across the world, it has no parallel. Not just in terms of sharing Krishna consciousness, but in terms of God consciousness anyway. Swinson Judah was a prominent uh, professor of religious studies. And he, he wrote in a book about the Krishna consciousness movement that if some author writes a book, a fiction story, about an old man at the age of 70 going alone in a ship, in a cargo ship, and then starting a global movement, since most publishers would reject the plot as unrealistic. Fiction also has to be believable, isn't it? But he says, in the case of Shri Prabhupada's life story, the story is stranger than fiction. It's more amazing. This is where in the history of the world do we have one person just inspiring people who we did not know at all to take up a way of life that they did not know at all. This is maybe we have some parallels in Jesus. Jesus, Jesus just called upon people and he said, called a fisherman and he said, you're fishing, stop being a fisherman of fish and become a fisherman of men. Follow me. Attract everyone in the net of God's grace. And people left everything and came to him. But still, there's a difference. Jesus was preaching to people of his own age, people of his own culture, people who knew him and who could connect with him. But with respect to Shri Prabhupada, there was Linguistic difference, cultural difference, generational difference, religious difference, educational difference. Now, it's very difficult to actually find out what was common between Prabhupada and his disciples. There are so many differences. The commonality, of course, was that Prabhupada had a sincere desire to share spirituality. And they had, a, among all their misled ways, they had, a, they had a strong desire to know about spirituality. And that was what the connection was. So at a material level, there's practically no connection. Now, Prabhupada had never broken any regulatory principles in his life. For many of the people who came to Prabhupada, breaking the regulatory principles was a regulatory principle. <laughs> <laughs> so at a material level, there was nothing common. So just as we said, the transcendental can manifest anywhere. The transcendental does not necessarily need a particular uh, uh, particular material setting to manifest. So the way Shri Prabhupada got Krishna consciousness to manifest in the world, that is just as extraordinary as Prutu manifesting through Vena. That in the unlikeliest of settings where people were utterly godless, the, the hippies were a very unusual phase in Western history. <clears throat> From the perspective of India, the Western world is often considered to be degraded. But the hippies were considered degraded even from the Western standards. <laughs> and Prabhupada took them and elevated them. So that is the extraordinary potency of Shri Prabhupada. And for someone who was able to do like this, and not just for one or two or three people, but for thousands and thousands of people, it's undeniable that there was some extraordinary potency over there. And thus, it can be rightly said that Prabhupada is a Shakti Avish avatar. He had some special Shakti which Krishna had given him. And if we consider Prabhupada as Shakti Avish avatar, then we understand also at the Shakti Avish avatar's list given by, Jiva, by the Goswami, 
is not exhaustive it is indicating it is indicating now there can be some special beings who are shakti avash avatars but the wonderful thing about the lord is that he can give his shakti to anyone and everyone he can empower anyone and everyone and that is his mercy so he can use the unlikeliest of souls for doing the most extraordinary of things and nimitta matram bhavasav pesachi krishna does arjuna become an instrument in my hands become an instrument for me so we all that is a call not just to arjuna but for all of us we all can become the vehicles by which the infinite can manifest infinite grace to us we all have certain capacities and we can do certain things according to those capacities but if we become devoted to krishna krishna can empower us to do things far beyond our capacities also that is krishna's mercy and throughout history in our tradition great souls have been empowered in this way and of course we are far away from such exalted souls but the fact is that just as krishna used those great souls in their generation every generation krishna needs souls from that generation krishna cannot use the great souls from the 15th 16th 17th centuries to share krishna consciousness in the 21st century krishna needs souls from the 21st century and each one of us if we try to become devoted if we try to become purified if we strive to become connected then krishna can use us in extraordinary ways and the responsibility for sharing our tradition in our generation is ours it is not the predecessors yes, they are much more glorious than what we are but they were glorious by krishna's grace and krishna will find some instruments to carry on his tradition in our generation also that included one incident Shri Prabhupada was in Mayapur and he heard how one of his most prominent disciples had somehow had a fall and he had decided to quit Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada wrote a very moving letter. Prabhupada said that, you know, I had such great hopes from you and now you have left me. I am feeling forlorn. Now, forlorn is actually a very poetic word. I am feeling like bereaved, lonely, abandoned. I am feeling forlorn. Now, Prabhupada had been come all alone on a ship at the age of seventy. He didn't feel full full. Prabhupada was always with Krishna, but Prabhupada was expressing how strong was the emotional connect that he had developed with those who he was caring for spiritually. He said, "I am feeling full alone." But then Prabhupada goes on saying, and then he concludes the letter by saying that I am confident that Lord Chaitanya will send the right souls to assist me in spreading his movement all over the world. and the prabhupada concludes if not you then someone else so if not you then someone else that doesn't mean that prabhupada treated souls like dispensable he had a personal relationship with everyone but ultimately if we don't take the responsibility krishna will krishna will empower somebody else to take that responsibility so we understand that at one level the finite and the infinite the boundaries are rigid the finite can never become infinite but the finite can become a channel for the infinite and each one of us can become a channel like that in our small or large ways however the lord wants to use us but if the lord chooses to use us we can do wonderful things for the world and even if the lord doesn't choose to use us like that still connecting with him will ensure that we will become we will become purer we will become better and ultimately we will attain him so in all ways connecting with the finite in finite is always auspicious for the finite i summarize i spoke today on the topic of how the finite and the infinite link with each other that is a broad topic i started by how the transcendental manifests through the biological so we are identified not just by who we are but by whose we are what group we belong to and one group is our lineage our parentage so here prutu is referred to by vainya as a son of vena this is not a denigration but a glorification 
that sometimes some people are from an illustrious past and they become illustrious themselves. Some people come from a very regrettable past and still they become glorious. That is also a glorification of them. So here, the Lord is manifesting through somebody who was evil. And that's just to demonstrate his transcendence. And for all of us, we, we do get not just our genetic characteristics from our parents, but also it's likely that the consciousness of our parents and our consciousness must have been similar. That's how we are born from there. Though we are products of our past, we are not prisoners of our past. And the, the door out of the past for us is through our purification, through our devotion to the Lord. So when <clears throat> Prutu is descending over here, I talked about the principle of avatar. So the Bhagavad Gita offers not just another worldview, but another world to view. There's material reality and spiritual reality. And some religious traditions say that the finite can never house the infinite. But that is based on a material conception of the infinite. God is infinite, but he's not stuck with his infinity. His infinity that he can manifest in the finite and still remain infinite. Some people say that God manifests only one time. And that actually limits God's grace. So the Bhakti tradition says that God is, God's love, the infinite love for the finite is infinite. And therefore there are infinite manifestations, as many as the waves in the ocean. Now in the Hindu tradition, some people say that everybody is God. That is patently false because we are all conditioned and limited. So... There are many times when the Lord descends and one special category which we discussed in the last part was Shakti Avishavatar. Where the, though the finite soul can never become infinite but the finite soul can become a channel for the infinite. Uh, and at that time the infinite can do extraordinary things. So Prutu Maharaj is considered an infinite. He's a soul like that and we discussed how Shri Prabhupada by based on the kind of accomplishment that he did for Krishna. You know, taking Krishna consciousness to people who didn't, he didn't know and gave them something, Krishna consciousness, which they didn't know. It's historically unprecedented. And it, it's reasonable to infer that he was extraordinarily empowered by the Lord. And if we consider him a Shakti Avishavata, then we understand Shakti Avish is not an exhaustive category, but an indicative category. And for all of us, we, we can also, if we become devoted and purified, we can also be empowered by the Lord. And the same Lord who engaged great souls in previous generations to carry on the tradition of compassion, he can also engage us. And if we choose not to become pure, and the Lord will carry on his mission, if not through us, then through someone else. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Yes, What's the difference between Vibhuti and Shakti Avishavatar? Generally, Vibhuti is basically something which is already present in the world, which is extraordinary. Like among mountains, I am the Himalayas, I am the Meru, among the rivers, I am Ganga. So they are already present in the world. And they, they are ex they, these are manifestations which are extraordinary in some way. And that extraordinariness is a pointer to the divine. So, whereas Shakti Avishavatars are specific time-bound descents of the Lord, the specific personalities. Now we, the, the personalities can also be Vibhutis. But if we consider among, you know, among uh, animals, I am the Mrugana, Murugendro. Among animals, I am the lion or the tiger. Different places, different things might be said. But whatever it is. Then, now there are always lions in the forest. So they are not Shakti Avishavatars. <laughs> they are lions. They, they are basically what? They are Vibhutis. That means um, the special power that they have, that power is coming from God and can point us to God. The concept of Vibhuti is, is explained by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita in response to Arjuna's question, Keshu Keshu Chibhaveshu Chinityosi Bhagavan Maya. Katham vidyam aham yogim stvam satha sada parichinte. Is while I am functioning in the world, how can I remember you? The idea is say, if we are studying in a university and then we find some professor who is just brilliant. We may actually be attracted to the professor's brilliance. 
But instead of just being attracted to that professor's brilliance, we see that this brilliance of this person is coming from Krishna. So what Krishna is telling is, whatever attracts our attraction, attention and attraction in the material world, see its attractiveness as my spark. So Vibhuti is any extraordinary display of power. Shakti Avishavatar is specific personalities who display, who display extraordinary power for furthering the Lord's mission. Now the Vibhutis may not be doing that. When a lion say pounces on a deer, they have nothing to do with raising God consciousness per se. Sometimes some Vibhutis can also be Asura. Some people might be stunningly beautiful, but then they may use their beauty to, to exploit others. Some people might be very smooth talkers, and they may use that to cheat others. So that capacity to talk, that is a Vibhuti, but it is being used for demonic purposes. So both in terms of the manifestation and the purpose for which they are used, both in terms of longevity of the manifestation and the purpose for which that manifestation is used, Vibhutis and uh, Shakti Ashwatas are different. Any other questions? Yes. Can manifest to okay. So if Krishna's love for us is infinite, then the love that we experience in the world, the material love, can it can it reach the infinite? Can it be directed toward the infinite? So basically, we have two kinds of relationship. We have a vertical relationship with Krishna and we have horizontal relationship with others. And in our relationship in this world, there are times when we do experience love. Maybe say when a, ma when a mother has a newborn baby, mother does have love for the baby. And that's, Prabhupada said, that's the closest we get to selfless love in this world, to the mother's love for a child. And in the Dhruva Maharaj past time, Dhuva Maharaj's mother Suniti says to her, says to him that whatever love can I can offer you, millions of mothers like me can't offer you as much love as Vishnu can offer. Now what this means is Vishnu's love is so great. But another point of this is that she is not considering her love as false. If this love were false, if it were zero, then millions of times of zero will also be zero. So the love we experience in the world is also real. But it is like a drop. It is like a drop in the sense that what happens, the same person who loves us, today sometimes two people, they, they say they are in love, they fight against the world. I can't live without you. And they fight against the whole world. And then after a few months, they say, I can't live with you. <laughs> so the love just disappears at times. And even if it doesn't disappear because of this, now our lifespans are finite. The love will end at that time at least. So we do experience enrichment even through our horizontal connections. We don't deny that, but we don't get captivated by that and we don't limit our love to only that. Some people spend their whole life searching for horizontal love. We definitely need loving relationships in this world. But even if we get wonderful relationships, even if we don't get wonderful relationships, the horizontal relationships are never going to last. So we need, we need to focus on developing the vertical relationship with the Lord. So you can consider it, say, here there's an ocean, we are in a desert. And suppose in the desert, there are some drops of water which are here, which take us to the ocean. Some drops of water just keep us at the same distance from the ocean. Some drops of water take us away from the ocean. Now we are here, we can choose, we can, okay, which drop should I pursue? So we might experience love in the association of devotees. Those are like drops which take us towards the ocean. The more we bond with devotees, the more that will make us closer to Krishna, take us closer to the ocean. Now, there might be some people who are not just non-devotees, they're, they're non-devotional, they're anti-devotional. They're completely against all devotional principles. And they may also be loving. But that love is like drops which take us away from the ocean. So, uh, we need to be careful about those kind of relationships. 
not that we necessarily reject them. If you're going to form them, better avoid them. But if you're already in that kind of relationship, then we don't get completely captivated or controlled by that. So our we our capacity for love is finite. But Krishna can accept even our finite finite love and he can reciprocate with that. So when we try to Krishna says Patram Pushpam Falam Toya, Yome Bhaktiya Priyachi. Daham bhakti upar, daham ashnami upar, in 926 he says, even if you offer me a fruit, a flower, a leaf, or even a little water, I accept it. If it's offered with love. So Krishna wants ultimately our heart. And he doesn't necessarily want the in, in, infinite love. He just wants our love. So we try to practice bhakti <coughs> with whatever capacity we have. And we try to offer our love to Krishna. And till we experience Krishna's love, we need horizontal relationships also. And we try to get that love, need for love fulfilled in a way that is devotionally harmonious. That doesn't take us away from Krishna. Does that answer your question? Infinite can manifest in infinite. Finite become infinite. He cannot become God, yeah. So Okay. So if you say that finite cannot become infinite, uh, then when they talk about moksha or nirvana, what exactly is that? Okay. See God is has multiple levels of manifestation. Just like if you consider this light. There is one localized source of light. But from there, from that bulb, light is radiating outward. So similarly, God has multiple manifestations. There is a personal manifestation who is called as Bhagawan. And then from him, there is an effulgence coming. That is called the Brahman or the Brahma Jyoti. So now both of them are at one level non-different. Because it's one God who is manifesting both ways. Vadantitatakodas tattvam yad jnana vadvayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagawan iti shabdite. So those who are in the spiritual traditions across the world, broadly speaking, there are personalists and impersonalists. So those who are personalists are attracted to the personal manifestation, to the Bhagwan, to the light source. The impersonalists are attracted to the light. Now quite often they are attracted to the light because they don't know anything about the source of light. In the issue of Krishna, there is a prayer, Hiranmayana Patreda Satya Pitamukham. My dear Lord, your true face is covered by a blinding brightness. So normally we think of darkness as blinding. But sometimes brightness can also be blinding. Like if you are traveling on a car on a road and the opposite driver suddenly there is a glare. You can't see anything. So we come out of the darkness of the material arena. But then we are, in the material world we are blinded by darkness. When we come out of the darkness, we can be blinded by brightness. And so, so in one sense, the idea that there is a light and I want to merge into that light. I want to become one with that light. That is a, is a natural, universal first step in spiritual realization. And at that time, the focus primarily is not so much on what is the nature of the ultimate reality. It is thus that this reality is full of misery and I want to get out of it. That's the whole idea of moksha, liberation. Means what? Okay, I'm bound here and to be bound is miserable. I want to get out of it. So, what to do after that, that is not very well thought out. So deep. It's like, suppose somebody is having arthritis. They're sick and they are in pain. And every movement of the body causes pain. I just move my ah. I move my head uh, and I just call out, ah, it's a constant pain. At that time, the first desire would be, I just want to stop moving. If I can stop moving, I'll be free from pain. Now that's true, but if you stop, if you can somehow stop moving and you can become free from pain, and then after that, you'll want to start moving again. Because you don't want to just stay motionless all the time. So the, I, the, here there's a misdiagnosis. 
and the understandable misdiagnosis. The cause of the pain is not the motion. The cause of the pain is the disease. So it appears to us that the motion is causing the pain, but it's not motion. It's the disease causing the pain. So similarly, some people have this idea that in the form and personality, all these are the cause of pain. That oh, when we get attracted to forms, we get deluded, and afterwards the form loses their resistance, their attractiveness, and then we uh, we are entangled. There are different kinds of people. Each of them have their attractiveness, but each of them have their limitations also, and again we get bound. So we say we feel, I just don't want any relationship. I don't want any form. I don't want any personality. I just want to be peaceful. And those who are, in a sense, their conception of spirituality is more uh, recoiling from the material reality. Not so much a propelling toward the spiritual reality. From based on positive attraction of spiritual reality. So their idea is, they just want to be liberated from this world. Now that is also possible, but the soul by nature is relational. We want relationships. And that's why going into that impersonal effulgence to become another particle of light, that is not a very palatable or sustainable uh, sustainable prospect for the soul. Okay. Now, liberation is definitely possible. And in, in bhakti also there is liberation. See, there are two kinds of liberation, you could say. This is often when I give seminars on de-addiction, I talk about this. There is freedom from and there is freedom for. What you are free from and what you are free for. So many times when somebody becomes an addict, say they become alcoholic or they become drug addicts, their whole focus goes on, I want to give this up, I want to give this up, I want to give this up, I want to be free from this. But that is a very negative focus. No. More important than giving up that habit is creating a life worth living. If you were free from this, what will you do? And you start doing that as much as you can do. So the focus is not on what we are free from, but what we are free for. So in bhakti, we focus on being free for loving Krishna, for serving Krishna, for delighting in our relationship with Krishna. And then we understand lust, anger, greed, all these they, they, they drag us away from Krishna. And that's why we don't want it. So a devotee is not so much interested in liberation for liberation's sake. A devotee is interested in liberation for love's sake. Because we will be liberated so that we can love Krishna. more. So that, that, is, that is considered to be the highest level of liberation. Because there, we, our focus is not just on our own peace, but it is on our Lord's pleasure. It is a more selfless understanding of spiritual perfection. Okay. Thank you very much. Granthraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Gaurabhakta Vrindaki. Yeah.